for parts of that scene, we were using um, a Steadicam, which is a camera apparatus affixed to the camera operator. And I don't think they were getting quite what they wanted as far as um, uh, how the photography was portraying the story. So I brought the dolly in so we could mount the camera on the dolly and give them a more stable platform. Um, Technical difficulties abound. Go ahead and have a seat. Thank you. Uh, please continue, sir. I, I think that was it for the... Okay. Um, so, while these gentlemen were speaking to me, did you explain that this was going to be a blocking? I did not. I let's, did not. let's go there. Um, explain what the blocking so, is. So, the decision was made to go from Steadicam to the Dolly. So, once we... Uh, it takes a moment to convert that camera over uh, from one uh, use to another. So I'm getting the dolly close to the pew where Mr. Baldwin, Harlan Rust, would be sitting and um, uh, working with uh, uh, the camera operator, Reed. Helena had kind of mentioned where she wanted us, but I believe her and her gaffer were um, starting to prepare for the turnaround of when the law men came into the church. Um, so we were just trying to find uh, blocking the shot, we would call it, trying to find the shot that best told the story in that moment that the, the director wanted to tell, which was to be, my understanding was to be an extreme close-up of Alec um, pulling the, starting to draw his weapon. And then from what I know in the edit, his cut um, would have been, you see you as the audience, see that weapon start to leave his holster. And then we were going to then put the camera behind him to see the lawmen enter the church. And that's when this shootout would have begun in the church. So were cameras rolling? Uh, no, we were still blocking the shot. And were you present in the church when Ms. Gutierrez brought the firearm into the church? Yes. And tell the jury what you saw and or heard. I, I don't, I never saw uh, the interaction between Hannah and Dave in the church, but I could hear uh, Hannah telling Dave that they, um, that the firearm had been uh, checked before lunch and had been locked up during lunch. And then uh, Dave called out cold gun or cold weapon. I heard the word cold. And that's when I went back to focusing on my uh, task at hand, helping uh, Reed and Helena find that insert shot. Uh, thank you, Mr. Adiego. Mm -hmm. um, so, do you recall who said cold gun? Did you describe that? Um, I did. Uh, it was I heard Dave Hall's call. I don't recall if it was cold gun or cold weapon, but I heard the word cold, which typically for me is what I need to hear. And, and cold gun means it's not going to go bang. Correct. Okay. Um, with regard to Ms. Gutierrez's statement that you overheard uh, about her not having checked the gun since lunch, did that cause you any concern? It did. Why? just accustomed to armors checking those guns again on a regular basis. And we had a break. Um, and typically that any firearm that's brought on set is checked, even if it had been checked previously. Do you know how the gun got from Ms. Gutierrez 
to Mr. Baldwin? I do not. So after you heard Ms. Gutierrez's voice and you heard Mr. Hall's uh, call out cold gun, where was the gun the next time you saw it? In um, Mr. Bald uh, yeah, in Mr. Baldwin's um, holster uh, on his left side. Um, did you see Ms. Gutierrez in the church? I don't recall seeing her in the church after lunch, no. So, go ahead and walk us through. Um, Mr. Baldwin now has the gun. Where is he, where is he sitting? What is he doing? Take us through this. Um, Mr. Baldwin seated in a church pew and, um, and uh, Reed and I are trying to find an angle looking kind of over his, um, his right elbow or right bicep to see his hands in his lap transition from his lap to uh, that firearm that's kind of hidden in a holster under the coat that he's wearing. Um, so if you can stand up, if you don't mind, and demonstrate what you believed Mr. Baldwin was supposed to do for the blocking. Um, my understanding was it was just to reveal uh, that part of, you know, the part of the gun that holds the bullets um, coming out of the holster. And then that portion of the, you know, that piece of photography was finished. Once we saw that gun coming out of the holster, it would again give the audience uh, the idea in that story that um, that Harlan Rust is about to uh, defend himself or try to shoot the lawmen before they shoot him as they enter the church. How close were the cameras to Mr. Baldwin? Um, the only camera we had in the church was um, I think at that point I was had the lens um, within a foot of Mr. Baldwin. And do you recall where Ms. Hutchins was? I do. You do? I do. Would you explain? Um, so directly, if, if I'm sitting in the pew as uh, Harlan Rust, um, Helena Hutchins was essentially directly in front of um, uh, Rust, uh, having a conversation with her gaffer. So there was maybe a couple of feet of air in between um, Mr. Baldwin and the pew that Helena and Serge were standing behind directly in front of Mr. Baldwin. And let me stop you. What's a gaffer? We don't know these terms. Oh, um, my apologies. Um, gaffer is the head of the lighting department. So he was discussing um, with the director of photography, my understanding, of course, is they were discussing what we were going to do when we turned around to see the lawman because we were already lit for the direction that we were filming. Do you remember the gaffer's name? Um, Serge is his first name, I believe his last name, and I, I don't want to slaughter it, but I think it was Svetne, Svetne, okay. I believe is his last name. Could you understand the conversation between Ms. Hutchins and Mr. Svetnoy? That's uh, my that's my thank you my um, best try. Um, so often, I we couldn't under none of us could understand um, because they often conversed in either um, Russian or Ukrainian, um, as they were both born and raised in that part of the world. So, do you know where Mr. Souza was at this point in time? Mr. Souza was uh, shoulder to shoulder just to my right. He was looking at my, uh, my dolly monitor so he could see what the camera was seeing. So why would the director be in the room looking at your monitor? Well, let me, let, let me ask it this way. Would the director normally be looking at that vantage point through from, from Video Village? Um, depends on the director and the situation. Sometimes they'll work with us more closely where they will be 
shoulder to shoulder and we'll look at my monitor. We were still waiting for the, um, uh, the new camera assistants to finish converting from steady cam to what we'd call studio mode. So I don't believe the camera actually had a monitor. Um, and potentially that's why he was looking over my shoulder instead of a bit removed in um, the video village. Okay, we're going to pause for a moment. Mm -hmm. We think we're going to be able to watch these videos and that's going to give everybody a much better idea of what was going on in there. Uh, we've already gone through the slate and et cetera, et cetera. I'm going to go ahead and play the video. This video will be uh, marked as States Exhibit 112. What's that noise we hear, that ch -ch I'm not actually sure. I was trying to figure that out myself. Oh. Who is the person um, speaking? Whose voice are we hearing? It sounds like Jensen Ankles. And, and is he an actor? He is an actor in Rust playing one of the lawmen, is my recollection. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Stand up slowly and toss in guns. Okay, we're going to do it again. And set and action. On the Rust, did you get up nice and slow? Toss any weapons you might have. There ain't no iteration of you walking out of this church unless you stand up slowly and toss them guns. Okay, and set. Mm. Okay, so there's the answer to your question. That's the answer to your question earlier, that sound. Why don't you explain to us what we're seeing? So what you just saw for a brief moment was one of the effects uh, department people coming in to um, uh, spray at what we'd call atmosphere. So dust or whatever there, I don't know what's in their uh, spray cam, but that is what that sound was. And that's what they were doing was adding atmosphere that makes it look a little foggy. And, and if hard light comes through those windows, you would kind of see those lights, uh, the rays of light in that fog. And I just uh, backed this video up to one minute, six seconds, so that I can ask you the position that Mr. Baldwin is sitting in in this video. Um, is that the same or similar position that he was in in the blocking scene after lunch? Uh, yes, similar. OK. Is there any way you can come up and see me open my eyes or you know what? I mean, like, let's say I'm down here like this, yeah. and when he says Harlan Rust, I'm gonna go, Boop. okay, and so you gotta come down here for that, yeah. Anyway, we'll see if we can do that. Ready? Here we go. Uh, you want on on another that? take, I mean, here we go. Ready? All right, another take. Where are we? <clears throat> and set, ready, and action. Harlan Rust, did you get up nice and slow? Toss any guns you have. There ain't no iteration of you walking out of this church unless you stand up slowly and toss some weapons. Russ. All right, let's go up the sensor. Can we try this? Uh, so let me ask you, just so that we get an idea, where we see Mr. Baldwin sitting in the church pew, 
Um, where is the door to the church? Behind the camera. From Mr. Baldwin's perspective, is it in front of him? In front of Mr. Baldwin, yes. And where is Mr. Ackles, uh, the gentleman who is speaking in the scene? Um, it sounds as though he's just to the left of the camera. So where would that be in relation to the door? Um, Jensen would be in between uh, Mr. Baldwin and the door. Okay, and, and if you can estimate how many feet, how big is this room and how many feet are there from where Mr. Baldwin is sitting to the door? In that instance, because we had moved the pews around a little, so in that instance, Mr. Baldwin's less than 20 feet from the door would be my guesstimation. Okay, and who's this gentleman here that we can see in the, in the video? Uh, that is uh, Dave Halls. Okay, I'm gonna go ahead and finish it just for mm -hmm. completeness and then we'll move on to our next one. Come on. All right. I am now going to play what will be marked as State's Exhibit 112A. Um, I would ask the court to uh, go ahead and admit 112A and give permission to publish. No objection, Your Honor. All right, 112A is admitted. You may publish. So, talk any weapons you have. One more. You good? Yeah. Ready? Set. Ready. And action. Arlen Russ? Did you get up nice and slow, talk any weapons you have? Stand right here for so, you. So whip it out. Yeah. Okay, well, let me get this all greased and ready. Okay, ready? Okay, ready? Ready. And set. Ready and action. Island Russ. So the, the blocking, you can take these, thank you, Shout. Um, the blocking that you were describing, um, as a person who was working in the room, were you expecting Mr. Baldwin to pull the gun all the way out? Like, like what we just saw in those clips? Um, 
in the blocking of uh, the ECU. What's the ECU? Uh, extreme close up. Okay. I was not. Okay. My uh, under. Go ahead. My understanding was it was just to kind of reveal that weapon coming out of the holster to the camera. So I think that we may have uh, ended uh, your description of what was going on in the after lunch session uh, where Mr. Souza was standing. Um, and were there other people in the church also? Yes. Do you know approximately how many people were in there? Um, myself, Reed, the camera operator, uh, Zach, uh, the boom guy was... When you say the boom guy, what is uh, boom? Sorry, sorry, guys. Uh, sound, sound, the sound, um, uh, the person handing, uh, holding the um, sound boom. So recording sound for the sound mixer was in the church. Um, Joel was uh, shoulder to shoulder, like I had described, looking at my monitor. Uh, I believe uh, Mamie Mitchell was to his right. Um, uh, wardrobe, a uh, woman named Doran was in there, I think, looking over Mimi's shoulder at the monitor. Um, Helena, Serge, um, my direct boss, uh, Reese Price, who's the key grip, he's the head of the grip department, um, had just come in uh, to work with Helena and Serge. Um, Dave Halls, um, and maybe uh, one of the effects guys, I recall, uh, was kind of in and out, keeping an eye on things, because they had, they had pre-rigged some of their effects stuff in the ceiling, uh, again, in preparation for the big turnaround that we were about to do. Okay. So I, don't, I didn't give you a number, but I think that works out to 12-ish. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Um, so keep walking us through it. What happens next? Um, so we, uh, I guess Reed and I are, are trying to find the camera angle that uh, Joel, the director, is, is happy with that he feels will tell that piece of the story. Um, I think, like I said earlier, mentioned earlier, I believe um, Helena and Serge were discussing how to change the lighting for the turnaround. Um, uh, Reese, uh, my boss, Reese Price was in there. I think he had just brought in a bounce card, maybe for that insert, maybe for the next shot. We don't know what a bounce card is. Uh, um, a lighting apparatus. So he was going to use some of the light um, coming through one of the windows and potentially um, reflect that back towards uh, Mr. Baldwin to help illuminate him. Um, and um, I think Joel and uh, Joel, the director, and Alec uh, had some uh, brief conversation back and forth about what the goal was for that shot. And, um, and I think Alec had drawn it once to kind of audition what he thought his action should be um, for uh, Joel. And, um, and then he drew it again, and um, it went off. And, uh, you know, instantly, I mean, a, a firearm went off in a small wooden church. So the concussion, ears ringing, that moment of panic in everybody, um, I think the first person I made eye contact with was was Helena, who was clearly injured by whatever that gunshot was, that noise we had just heard. And in fact, she was starting to go flush and uh, I think holding her, her right side um, and, uh, and then I, I think that Joel uh, let out some sort of uh, uh, scream or, or made some noise that, you know, to indicate he was also injured. And um, I think I just uh, went to my attention, went to Joel because he was the closest to me. Um, I think Reed, I recall Reed and 
Serge moving um, Pew out of the way to help Helena get to the, basically to lay Helena down and, and start um, tending to her, figure out what her injuries were or injury. Um, and I started uh, attending to um, uh, Joel. I think I yelled out that if you can't help us, get the fuck out of here. And someone called 911, and I do recall uh, Mimi's voice in the distance talking to 911 and, and telling where we're at. And um, I tried to calm Joel down. We had a good rapport, so I just tried to calm him down and, and let him know that we were going to get through it because I didn't know what else to do in that moment. Um, and then soon after, uh, the medic and the best boy, Electric, uh, came into the church. Um, and, and I'm going to stop you real quick. Mm -hmm. The medic, do you recall her name? Um, her, I, her first name was Cher. I don't recall her last name. Okay. And who was the other person you said best boy? The best boy, Electric. Uh, Matt uh, Hemmer, I believe, was his last name. He was uh, Serge's... Uh, second in command is what a best boy is so um, the gaffer and the key grip each have a best boy and then the rest of their department um, and uh, my understanding was Matt had some combat medical training um, so he came in to assist the uh, medic share and um, I think I, I um, when Right after the gun went off, do you recall seeing Ms. Gutierrez in the church? I do not. Um, and did Mr. Baldwin stay in the church? I, he sat down in that same pew, I think in that moment when I yelled out that if you can't help us, you need to you know, get out of here. I think he sat down and then at some point, I know I... I looked over and he was gone, so. Okay, and in terms of your attention to Mr. Souza, um, what were you doing to him? Were you touching his body? What were you doing? I was, I was. So um, Joel was wearing a, kind of a, a thick hoodie, and I believe he had a t-shirt or a couple shirts on underneath so it was start to uh, figure out where uh, Joel had been injured he was certainly at that point um, writhing in pain and and uh, concerned for himself asking me how Helena was and and I think come into the realization that he had been shot um, so I was trying to find uh, where he was wounded, um, so started pulling back his hoodie to uh, reveal what appeared to be a circular wound in his right shoulder. And at that point, um, I think the the sheriff and uh, Matt came in. Uh, they had gloved hands. I didn't, so I had some of his blood on my hands. And um, I think I helped them uh, roll. Joel over um, one of them had uh, trauma shears to cut his shirt off and then I helped roll him over and I was in a position um, to see that uh, what appeared to be um, a bullet just under the skin um, basically where his right shoulder blade was um, and he was in a great deal of pain and um, I think that Cher gave me some gauze to just put some uh, pressure on the wound while they attended to um, Helena's injuries, which uh, I gathered at that time were certainly much more severe because of her uh, proximity to the firearm. And could you hear Ms. Hutchins? I, I know you indicated that Mr. Souza was um, kind of yelling out in pain. Uh, did you hear anything from Ms. Hutchins? If I did, it was just, uh, you know, the groaning and 
discomfort from being uh, shot by a firearm. I don't remember anything verbal from uh, Helena. Okay. And at some point, did paramedics arrive? Uh, yes. And if you know, at some point, was Ms. Hutchins uh, taken for medical care offset? Um, yeah, she, thank you, sir. Um, um, I stayed with Joel uh, until they carried him out, and what I uh, observed was they were trying to um, uh, stabilize her. I heard them call for a, a life light, so they were trying to stable <laughs> stabilize her to get her in a helicopter and get her to whatever ER they felt was uh, appropriate. And at some point in time, were you notified that Ms. Hutchins had passed? <laughs> yes. Mr. Adiego, when, when you heard the gunshot and you saw these people fall, did it occur to you in that moment that it was a live round, that there was a real, a, a real bullet in that gun? Um, I don't, maybe not in that moment. I think it became clear when, uh, like I mentioned, I, I rolled Joel over, helped roll Joel over to see what very much looked like a large caliber bullet just being barely held in by his skin. Okay. And is this the first time in your life that you've ever seen a bullet? Uh, no. Okay. So you knew a bullet when you saw one? I, yes. Okay. Um, did you ever see Ms. Gutierrez after the gunshot went off? Not until today. Okay. And I want to back up. Um, the, the people who, the camera crew that walked off that morning, did you know those people? Um, as well as you can know anyone in two weeks, sure. Based on your time on set and everything that you knew about what was going on on that movie set, do you have any reason to believe that any of those people planted live ammunition on set? Judge, I'm gonna object to speculation, lack of foundation, whatever he knows any of that. Well, I think he can answer the question whether he has any reason to believe that they did or not. Council approach.
Sir, do you recall the question? I don't. Do you have any reason to believe that live ammunition was planted by disgruntled crew members who left that morning? I, I do not. And based on everything that you heard when you were in the church after lunch, do you have any understanding of who the person was that loaded that gun? Um, yes. Who is the person that you believe loaded the gun? The armor. And who's that person? Um, Hannah Gutierrez Reed. And do you see her sitting in court today? I, I have seen her. She's behind you, yes. Okay. And just for the record, can, can you point out what, what Ms. Gutierrez is wearing? Uh, gray blazer, 